your Bible this morning and turn to the book of John. The book of John, looking in chapter 1. Seeing what God's Word tells us this morning from John chapter 1. We're going to get ready here in a few minutes in verse 6. But don't you just love babies? All these are the cutest little things in the world. I love little babies. I don't know what it is about children, but you can put an 800 pound old muscular old man in a room with a baby, and that little old muscular man's like, oh, you little thing. Oh, they're so cute. When you get around babies, there's something about us that makes us make these funny faces. And we say words we would not be caught dead saying elsewhere. Oh, you little googly googly googly. You know how we are around little kids. I've seen y'all when y'all get around Cooper, how y'all act. Like? We like little kids, and something about us as adults, when we get around children, we like looking at their fingers, and we like poking their little bellies, and we like rubbing little heads, and we all have experience, many of us have the joy of childbirth, and I've had three kids myself, and I remember when those babies came out, I got to hold them and love them, and I, I wanted to smooch on them, they, they were perfect in my eyes, and I got to love on them, and I got to count their fingers and pop their little toes, and oh, I just love the feeling of holding those small little babies in my hands. And as I began to grow up, I still had that little fascination, if you will, with babies, and many of you men are like me, uh, especially if you have girls. I was uh, upset one time, I had to go get some police clothes and try on some at Azar's, and I've been there, they told me, go ahead and get down to your boxers or your underwear. I uh, want to dress you up. And so here I'm getting up in my skitties. And next thing you know, I take my socks off. And I had just forgot that I spent the night with my three girls that night. And uh, they got to play makeup with Daddy. All my toenails were different colors. And they were shining to high heaven. And of all things in the world, it was a big old man that was you know, getting me dressed. And he looked down at my toes and he says, boy... I'm not going to ask no questions. <laughs> and I said, you better not. There I am. I'm a happy father. That means I'm a good daddy. So I told him. Even worse, one time I, I got called early in the morning. I had to wake up for a call. And I woke up and got the uniform on, ready to go. Went to the, the, uh, the, 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 the mirror. mirror. There's the word. To comb my hair real quick. As soon as I got the mirror, I realized I had my fake eyelashes on. And still have my makeup all over my face. There's some privileges of having girls having babies in the house. They can do no wrong in our sight. Well, there's some kind of little wrong when it comes to Christmas time. That's where our whole attention is at fully is on the baby in the manger. If we get so focused on that baby in the manger, we're going to miss who Jesus truly, really, really is. This one, I have one simple question. Is this question here. Will you experience Christmas this year? Here's what John chapter 1 says. Starting in verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. <clears throat> he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Verse 11, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It's not up here. There she is. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Father God, be with us this morning. So get your Word. Father, this morning, reveal this mystery to us about who you truly are. Help us pass the cradle, Father, and get to the cross. Help us see your will of all things we do. In Christ, we do pray. Amen. There's something about babies. We understand children. They kind of have the mind like we all do, that simple mind. We, we like the fact of the baby because it's so simple. It's so helpless. And that's where a lot of faith is still at. It's on the defenseless little child. This morning, there's a verse in Ephesians 4 that says this. In all things, grow up. I like that verse. 
and all things grow up in Him who is the head that is in Christ. Understand something. We all know that Christ got up. We all know that Christ got out of that, uh, the, out of that manger. We all know that Christ raised Himself. We know that Christ grew emotionally, grew physically. He became the God that He is or was the God from the cradle of the cross. But He was fully that God. Here's the fact. A lot of people's attention this whole entire season is on that. And when your whole attention is on that, you miss out on who Jesus truly is. Nowhere we said last Sunday, nowhere in God's Word were we ever commanded to keep and honor Christmas. Nowhere were we ever commanded to celebrate Christmas. You know the very first one, actually, you're going to back up, when the Puritans came over here to America, you know, they didn't have Christmas celebrations. They left the Church of England, and those churches come here for freedom of religion. It's not to celebrate the way men did. So for, the, for the, about the first 200 years, there was no Christmas celebration. The very first state that actually made Christmas an official holiday, guess what state it was? What in California? What in New York? It's the state in you're in right now. Alabama in the 1830s was the very first state to make Christmas a state holiday. Now it's turned into a national holiday. Even Charles Spurgeon, as late as early 1900s, late 1800s, preached against the Christmas season. How can we as Christians preach about the Christmas season? Because it doesn't matter that much. It does not nearly as matter as much as what happens in the Easter season. But look at who Christ officially is and see what God's Word tells us about this. On your calendars, if you have your calendar, you'll see that there's a date on it. That date is December 25th. You'll know that no matter how hard you press, no matter how hard you try, you cannot stop that day from coming. You're trying to want to stop the day from coming. For many of y'all, you have to go back to work tomorrow. Praise God, I'm off on weekends now. And I've got to go back to work tomorrow on Monday. But something about Mondays we all despise. We just don't want Mondays to come. I see some of y'all's Facebook pages like just begging the Lord not to let Monday get here because you have to go back to work. I see some of those things. But no matter how hard you want it, none of you can stop the 25th from coming. You can try, you can pray. The only way to stop it is the Lord comes back. That's the only way. Now, just because the 25th comes, and just because it says Christmas Day on that calendar, does not mean that every single person will experience Christmas on the 25th. Because here's that old saying. That first part, the world's trying to put a little X in front of and say, Xmas, you know you can't have Christmas without the Christ. Now, we know our Christ is not just the baby in a manger. My children, they like watching this video. And yes, we watch the one that is the, the edited version, not all the bad words, and it's a bad show. But it's called, and they'll watch a whole lot more, uh, Talladega Nights. Have you ever seen that movie? And they sit down at the table, they're all sitting there praying, and they said, Dear Lord, baby Jesus. And I had to stop Trini doing that, because Trini would, in some of her prayers, she'd say, Dear Lord, baby Jesus. I'm like, no, that's, we're not going to do that. That's almost like a heresy. We're not going to pray like that. We're going to correct our children, train our children the right way to be. So we corrected all that. That video went out the door. We quit watching that kind of stuff. But that's the way many people, they only see Jesus as that helpless, infantile little being instead of the God and who He is. As the Scripture tells us that it's time for us to grow up. Christ grew up. He's no longer in that manger. He's no longer laying in the hay. He has... Moved on. So we need to do I wrote these down so I'm going to forget them. We need to move on from the wonder to the worship. Move on from a story of a baby in the hay to being the salvation laid there. We need to go beyond being charmed by the Christmas story and being changed by it. Go beyond tradition and being transformed. This past week, now this convicted me this past week. I'm not saying it's a sin by any means. Please don't get me wrong I say this. I was reading a passage this past week in the book of Jeremiah. And it says that about the trees. It says do not cut down trees. Do not decorate those trees. Do not put uh, decorations. You don't believe it? Look in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. You'll see the verse to back my theory up. But it says do not cut down trees. Do not decorate them with gold and silver. Do not put them up in your homes. And do not hold them up so they not teeter over. What does it sound like? It says that. Now, now nothing wrong with a tree. We can, you can find the devil in anything, okay? I'm just... But the Lord convicted me about that one. And my personal conviction, personal, is I told Jess, I said, Jess, read this verse. And she goes, 
Does that mean our Christmas trees are sinning? I said, no. It does not mean you're sinning by having a Christmas tree in your home. No. I said, let's do something different this year. Let's, you know, I, like, I like change. Yes, I know it's a bad word among badness, but I like change. And I said, I want to try something this year because we're out you. And she says, well, what is it? I said, let's take down the tree. She goes, no! To be all better, put up, let's leave it up. I said, no, listen, listen. Let's take down the tree just this year. And what we're going to do is put up a cross instead. And we're going to decorate the cross with lights and put some green around the cross. And that's going to be our Christmas cross this year. And she goes, that, well, well, I've always had a tree at Christmas time. I always had a tree. And I said, that's the tradition of it. I said, no, we're in the Bible. You come in and have a tree. I said, no, let's just have just something different this year. Just say, just to set us apart. Because the Bible says we're called to be different. The whole world's got Christmas trees up. Let's be different. So I'm going to be different. And I said, let's have a cross instead. Okay. And all of a sudden, I looked over my corner, and she's got another tree up in the house. And she goes, can we just have both? And I said, yeah, we just have both. So you got the tree and got the cross. And uh, that goes back to our tradition. Our tradition says we decorate for Christmas. Also, we need to move away from the admiration of the child to the admiration of the Savior. Move from understanding that Christmas is not about the baby, not about the manger, not about the swollen clothes. It's about our reaction and our response to that. So this morning, I'm going to move on past that of truly worshiping the risen Savior, of who that baby in the manger actually grew up to be. So here we are looking at what Scripture tells us this morning, we know that uh, back in the Bible days that as Christ began to mature, as He got up out of that cradle, as He began to mature and be the full Godhead, that He began to be worshipped by all. The Bible says that when He healed somebody, they bowed down and they worshipped Him. After Christ walked on the water, the Bible says that disciples bowed down and worshipped Him. The Bible says that after He cast out the demon, out of that man in the Gazarenes, the Bible says that the man that was once demon-possessed fell down and worshipped Him. The Bible tells us also that as the ladies go to the tomb that morning to find Christ, the angels not there, told that Christ is not there, that they're going back to tell the disciples and they see Jesus on the road and they bow down and start worshipping Him. Here's what Christmas is all about. Ready for it? It's not about this. It's not about all this. Christmas is all about you worshipping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Unless you're worshipping the Savior, you're not really having Christmas. Now, the 25th may come. You may have a season at your house. may have a holiday at your home. But unless Christ is worshipped around your tree or around your dinner table or wherever you're having Christmas at, unless Christ is the very center of it, you're not really having Christmas. And a lot of people this year are going to miss out on the true blessing of this holy day. Because they're not having Christ at the very center of it. Like last time we told you that the innkeepers, all the, the all the homes all around Bethlehem had no room for the Savior to be born in. It's like many homes today. We don't make any room at all on our homes because all the clutter for the Savior to be welcomed in. So here we are, learning about our wonderful Savior. True traditions getting back to the truth. Remove this counterfeit Christmas and getting Christ out of the cradle and putting Christ back in our hearts. How can we experience the true Christmas this year? What can we do to truly say we've experienced Christmas? Here's the first one. Experience the cross instead of the cradle. It's great that our Savior is born. I pride myself in knowing that my God came down this earth, was born of a virgin. I pride the fact that my Savior had to leave the throne room of heaven and had to leave his, the glory and the majesty, leave all the praise and the worship that was up there in heaven to come down here in this whole terrible world and be born for us. But Him being born did nothing for us. There's no... Get the right word. Here's what here's what he did for us. The cradle, he was born, but yet it's the cross that matters for us. 
Him being born is great. He had to be born. But He died for us so we can be saved. He rose again so we can defeat death on the grave. He took our stripes so we can be healed of sin. He took our stripes so we can be healed of all the, the pressures of this world. But that doesn't mean anything compared to what the cross means to us. Here's the next one. Experience the king instead of the child. You get around children, how do you use the day? I mean, I've never phrased that question. You as grandparents, they're happy your grandparents. How do y'all act when your grandkids? Silly, crazy, just wild. They took you out a little bit, you chase them around the yards, and you just something about the grandkids and the kids, you run after them like crazy. And we treat them like kids. Because they're kids. And that's why people treat Jesus. As though he's still some infantile laying in a manger. Ah. My Savior is not a baby. My Savior is not some defenseless little child or some toddler. My Savior is a king. And you know what that means about us? We watched this past week, now a bunch, bunch of heresies in church. Remember that, that video y'all saw this past time? But one of the, the videos says that that was a heresy was that God, since He and God came together, He created us and we're all gods like He is. Well, that's false. That's heresy. But here is the fact. God, our Father, is the King, makes us all royalty. It means our Father is not some baby. Our Father is a King who owns a thousand cattle and a thousand hills. And it shows us how powerful our King is. Here's the next one. Experience the powerful instead of the powerless. We know that babies have a lot of strength in their voice, don't we? You don't believe me? Could probably wait up here in a minute after hollering. You'll experience the power in the baby's voice. Something about a screaming child makes us all stay but not done. Remember when you had your first child and the baby had that little tummy ache? Nobody ever had tummy ache growing up. <laughs> Nobody ever came out of mine was just spoiled rotten that drank too much sour milk and decided to come back up one o'clock in the morning and the poor old tummy was aching and they went to holler. Can we all say there was no sleep in the house that night? You want to hold the baby, you rock the baby, you're holding it and just please stop. There's a lot of power in that voice. But to a degree, that baby's very powerless. If everything it has to do, it depends on us to do it. We got to feed it. We got to change it. We got to take care of it. We clothe it. We are in full control of that child. And that's the way you people want to see Jesus is that still that defenseless, helpless child that we're in control of. That's not my Savior. The Bible says, My God is all powerful. The verse that back it up says this And Jesus spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. In other words, when it says all authority, it means all power over all things has been given to our Lord and Savior. I mean, we can't control Him. We can't limit Him. We can't hold Him back because He is all powerful. Here's the next one. When it experienced the empty grave instead of the full stable. Now, the Bible does not say there was animals around the stable. That were there animals? Probably. I wouldn't doubt it. There usually is animals on a farm. I would not doubt that. But it doesn't say. But we know that there was Mary, and there was Joseph, and there was baby Jesus. Do know that there were shepherds that did come from the fields that night. They came to see baby Jesus. So we do know that the stable, the cave, if you will, was full that night to agree. But we need to move past that a little bit. It says here in Matthew 28, He is not here. He is risen. Just as He has said, Come and see the place He was lying. See, we, that stable is completely full. But that morning, on that Easter Sunday morning, right early in the morning, all the women went to the tomb. And the only person they found there was an angel. And the angel says that the Savior is not here. You see, that means more to me as a believer than this does. Knowing that my Savior was born is great. I can celebrate that fact, rejoice in that fact. But it means more to me knowing that that grave is now empty. That means that my Savior defeated death for me. Knowing that He defeated hell for me. Knowing that I don't have to go there and I can believe in Him and be saved. Here's the next one. Experience the gift to give, the best gift to give, 
instead of giving many gifts. Be honest. How many of you right now have done all your Christmas shopping? Anybody? Anybody started yet? <laughs> Last night I started buying my Christmas shopping. Yes, I'm a week. Or from my wife's opinion, I'm three months late. But I'm just got started last night. And I'm like many people, I don't shop in stores very much. I despise going to the Choi Mall. You ever been there? It's called Walmart. I despise going there. I don't like it. They're very unfriendly. I don't mind saying that. They're the most unfriendliest folks ever been in my life at Walmart. I don't like going there. So I buy all my shopping, do all my shopping online. It gets delivered to your house for free. It's there in a couple days. I'm in no hurry. So why not? You know, pay tax sometimes. So just why not? So I buy it online. You know what? I've never been hit by a buggy online. You know that? Nobody's ever hard at me and cussed at me online. Nobody's ever denied my credit card. Well, one time I did. Online. You know, but uh, that's how it usually works. I like online shopping. Well, this past week, uh, last night I was sitting at home, had my night last night off, and I said, I'm going to do some Christmas shopping. And Jessica goes in there, let me go get ready. I said, no, you can stay in my job. I'm going to do it right here on my computer. And she gets all upset. I'm like, I want to go shopping. I said, I am. I'm going shopping on my computer. So, of course, I go to the Troy Mall, Walmart.com, and I start looking at some stuff for Christmas. And I go and buy the girls some stuff, and I go and buy Jessica some stuff. And uh, next thing you know, Jessica says, what did you buy? Well, you know it's no fun if you tell them the gift is. So I said, Jessica, don't worry about what I bought. And here's what she said. You bought another gun, didn't you? <laughs> and I, of course, I just went with it and said, yeah, I did. And she said, I can't believe you bought another gun. We got a whole house full of them. What do you need another gun for? I said, well, Jessica, I ain't got one in this color. I need one like this one. Everybody needs a blue turquoise gun. I need one. <laughs> I need it. And she said, you don't need another one. She, she got mad, y'all. When I say she got mad, I just sit there laughing. I was going to do it in front of her. No, I was laughing under, under, my, under my breath. I was laughing. And she kept just fussing and fussing. You don't need a gun. You got too many out of it. You sell the ones you got. And then she broke out and said this. It is only two weeks before Christmas, and you think you'd be out getting your girl something. Woo! <laughs> Instead of buying yourself something. I said, Jessica, it's true. We can all shoot the gun together. <laughs> so don't tell her I didn't buy, I didn't buy guns. So when she comes in next week, she'll be surprised. But that's how it is. We do all this shopping and all this stuff for people that we love, right? And she's going to buy stuff because we love them. We want to show them how much we care about them. So buy them something for the holiday season, the Christmas season. But I never forget this. So me and Trinity and Tiffany and Charity were in Walmart a few months ago. Trust me, it's one of those art, another one in Troy. We're in those art Walmart shopping around, and all of a sudden, Tiffany likes, you know what slime is? You know what slime? I don't know why kids like slime. I don't have a clue, but if you know what slime is, just pick your nose, and there it is. That's, that's, that's about, that's about the, the consistency of them like playing with slime and having all of the carpet and all the remaining in the car. It's slime everywhere. Like, they want ghosts. You can watch ghost, uh, ghost books up there. Ghostbusters back in the day with slime everywhere. They love that stuff. They watch videos on YouTube about slime. I don't know why. But we're at Walmart in Ozark. And Charity and Kimmy come to me and said, Daddy, can you please buy some slime? And I said, Baby, we don't need no more of that junk. They said, Well, can you get it for me for Christmas? And I said, I guess I'll buy you some slime for Christmas. I said, What are you going to give me? And they said, Daddy, it's not your birthday. <laughs> and I said, it's not your birthday either. Go on, eat more slime. But isn't that kind of true, though? This Christmas season is not about us. It's about him. It's his birthday celebration. Here's the question for We're giving all these gifts to each other and all these gifts to all those we love, but are we truly giving the gift to the one that we truly supposed to love the most? Is our home a truly a gift he's welcoming to? What are you truly giving him has the greatest gift. But well, the Bible tells us what he wants. Here's what he all, here's all he wants for Christmas. And that is two for a tea. Romans 12 says this. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, to your spiritual service of worship. You know what he wants? Good knows. He wants this. He wants us. He wants our devotion. He wants our worship. Here's the next one. Experience the rebirth 
instead of the earth. Yes, it's great to celebrate Christmas. You know the most important day for a Christian? They should never forget. The 25th doesn't matter. We know what exact day Christ is born on. But one day you should never forget is the day you were reborn. Scripture tells us this. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. There must come a time in our life that we know we're a sinner. We must confess our sin. and must be reborn. must be born again of God. Here's the next one. Cry out, Coop. Experience the city of heaven. It's the town of Bethlehem. Scripture tells us in Philippians, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord of Earth. You know, we sing songs about Bethlehem right now. We sing all about the Christmas season and Christ born in the manger. But all that's worldly. All that's of this world. It's great to think of our home and our house, and all, but all this stuff is worldly. Our minds should be set on one thing, one thing only. Of where our citizenship actually lies. I never forget, I told one time that I'm so heavenly minded, I'm no earthly good. Hurt my feelings one time, somebody told me that, but I'm glad of the fact that my mind is on heaven. Because that's where my, my desire, where, wherever your heart is, there you shall be. So my heart is on the things of God. I thought my heart's on heaven. Because I'm going to go back there one day. Why well, enjoy the things of this earth? Yes, it's great to celebrate, but our real joy should be on the treasures for up there. Here's our last one. Experience the coming king instead of the child born. Yes, it's great to celebrate the manger. Yes, it's great to celebrate Christmas, the baby being born. But the most important thing is not that he came, but that he's coming again. Christ tells us, especially in the book of 1 Corinthians, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed. Who recompense means paid back. How many of you got recompense this past week? If you got a job, hopefully you did. If you don't get recompense for your job, I'd probably quit your job, but I'm usually going to get paid. Paid back for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. The word truth tells us this that one day we're all going to appear before not a manger, we're going to appear before a throne. And there our kings will sit upon that throne. And guess what he's going to do to us? He's going to judge us based on what we've done wrong and what we've done right. Now, it's not saying he's going to judge us based upon our sin because we know that our sin has been forgiven, but he's going to judge us based on what we've done with Christ since we've had it. I mean, truly grew in the faith. We got stronger in our faith. Having treated Christ as an infant, I treated Christ as a king. Christ coming. It's the child born. We're going to pray this morning. It's our prayer. Now, our prayer is this. That as we go throughout the rest of the season, let's focus on this with the mentality of the cross. There's a picture you sent a minute ago. And I, we'll look at it in a few minutes after we go to the service. But there's going to be a picture of what we recorded when Trinity was a small child. And what happened is we took the poor old baby Trinity and he wrapped her in little swaddling clothes we laid her on some little hay, and we had we got the video recorder. We recorded her, and she was moving and stretching and doing like little small children love to do. But behind all that was the silhouette of a cross. Because all that's important, but none of that matters unless the cross is in view. Just the cross, the cross was born, didn't save us. His cross is what saved us. This is just the fact that he did was born. We're going to take part in a new part of the service, our Lord's Supper. And this is the part we're commanded to celebrate. This is what we're commanded to take part in and to remember. It's the fact that our Savior, yes, was born, but more importantly, the sacrifice He had. That He shed His blood for our sins. He took the punishment that we should have had all because He loved us. So what is one step real quick? Let's so all pray this prayer that we'll truly experience Christmas this year. You need to come to the altar and pray or confess your known sins before you take part in the Lord's Supper. I'm about you to do it now. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, I do love you.